Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, some of you have been with me since the morning. Uh, and thank you for your patience this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you got something to eat. Uh, I'll make a few opening remarks and then I'm happy to take your questions. Alors, bonjour tout le monde. Comme je l'ai dit plus tôt, l'inflation est un phénomène mondial attribuable en grande partie aux conséquences à long terme d'une pandémie qui ne surviennent qu'une fois dans une vie, et ce phénomène est amplifié par la politique COVID-0, mise en place par la Chine et l'invasion illégale de l'Ukraine par la Russie. Ici au Canada et partout dans le monde, cela signifie des prix plus élevés à la caisse et à la pompe. Nous savons que les Canadiens et les Canadiennes sont préoccupés par l'inflation et qu'ils se demandent ce que va faire le gouvernement les aider. Aujourd'hui, j'ai présenté la réponse gouvernement face à l'inflation. Notre plan pour rendre la vie plus abordable avec des mesures concrètes pour aider des millions de Canadiennes et de Canadiens à faire face au coût de la vie. Ce plan comprend les mesures suivantes. La bonification d'allocation canadienne pour les travailleurs afin de fournir 1,7 milliard de dollars en nouveau appui aux travailleurs cette année, ce qui permettra de mettre jusqu'à 2 400 dollars de plus dans les poches des familles à faible revenu à partir de cette année. Deuxièmement, une réduction des frais de garde de 50 en moyenne d'ici la fin de cette année. Troisièmement, une augmentation de 10 de la sécurité de la VS pour les années de plus de 75 ans, ce qui permettra de verser plus de 766 dollars de plus cette année. Quatre, un paiement de 500 dollars qui sera versé cette année à près d'une million de Canadiens qui ont de la difficulté à payer leur loyer. Cinq, des soins dentaires pour les Canadiens dont le revenu est inférieur à 90 000 dollars, en commençant pour les enfants de moins de 12 ans cette année. Et 6. L'indexation des prestations à l'inflation, notamment l'allocation canadienne pour, pour enfants, le crédit pour TPS, le régime de pension du Canada, la sécurité de la VS et le supplément du revenu garanti. Les mesures dans ce plan pour réduire le coût de la vie sont, appui, sont un appui complètement nouveau pour les Canadiens. Il s'agit de 8,9 millions de dollars qu'ils n'ont pas reçu l'an dernier. This is new money for the Canadians who are receiving it this year, but we built these measures into our last two budgets. And for the Canadians who need it most, this will make their lives more affordable at exactly the right time. The five key points I spoke about earlier today respect for the central role of the Bank of Canada, investing in people, fiscal restraint, good jobs, and this affordability plan will help us move from a robust recovery from the COVID recession to sustained and steady growth. Our plan will help tackle inflation and make life more affordable for Canadians. I'm confident that our plan is the right one. Thank you. And I'm happy to take your questions. Three minutes, John Bennett, Valley Rao with CTV National News. You know, a lot of Canadians are, are growing concerned that we'll see a recession here in Canada. Bloomberg Economics just put the odds at 72% of a recession by 2024. You know, what is the operating assumption of the government at this point? What odds would you put on there being a recession in Canada in the next couple of years? So, in the budget uh, in April, we 
presented three scenarios. We had the baseline forecast, which is based, as you know, on an average of the forecasts of base street economists. And then we had two scenarios showing a tougher economic environment, moderately tougher and much tougher. So we've already been looking at that. And for people who are interested in seeing what impact we think that would have on Canada's fiscal position, uh, I would urge you take a look. We address that at some length in the budget. Having said that, um, you know, let me repeat what I said earlier today. It's a good question to ask because Today's global economic environment is very volatile. And I think only a naive or arrogant or foolhardy person would claim to have certainty about where we are going. It, it is a time of significant uncertainty. And it's important to be candid with Canadians about that because Canadians are smart. But what I also want to say to people is, of all countries in the world, I am really confident that there is truly no country that is facing this turbulent global economy from a stronger position than Canada. We are going into it with very strong growth. IMF, OECD are predicting Canada will have the strongest growth in the G7 this year and next year. We're going into this turbulent environment with a very strong jobs and labor market, which I think is really important in the lives of people. And we're going into this tough environment with a very strong fiscal position. So there is a lot of uncertainty. There are a lot of challenges in the world economy. Uh, Canada is going into this challenging environment in a strong position. And I want to say to Canadians, you know, the government is going to be there to support Canadians. The other question was just about, uh, in two hours we're going to find out which Canadian cities get to host the FIFA World Cup. Very exciting <laughs> announcement. But those yes, cities, it is. though, they're going to be looking to the federal government for funding. I know Toronto has estimated the cost at about $290 million. They want to put in a third. They want a third from the federal government. You know, what commitment can you make right now? in terms of funding uh, to, to host for, to these host cities for the World Cup? Okay, first of all, thanks for asking the question. It is exciting. Um, and uh, my husband is English. So in our house, soccer, which he would insist should be called football, is a particularly hot topic. Um, also, as a Toronto MP, but someone who grew up in Edmonton, um, it is really exciting. Um, in terms of uh, support going forward, let's wait to talk about that until we know what the decision is. But I do want to say to all Canadians, and okay, I'm a Toronto MP to Torontonians, this is very exciting. Thank you. Hi, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, James Munson with Bloomberg Tax. Um, I have a fairly specific question about the digital services tax that your government is planning. Mm -hmm. Is, are, you putting, are you sticking to the January 1st, 2024 um, enforcement date for that, now that the OECD Secretary General has said that the uh, multilateral convention on global tax reform isn't going to happen until 2024 at the earliest? We were clear in the budget as to our position. Uh, we were clear in this year's budget. We were clear in last year's budget. We were clear in the fall economic statement. The Canadian position is unchanged. Has it changed? Um, and is, is the, um, um, I guess, slower than expected progress or at least slower than planned progress of the OECD um, convention deliberations affecting at all the way you're thinking about uh, implementing the digital services tax? It's a good question, but as I said, the Canadian position is unchanged. I do also want to say um, this is a really important issue. The OECD deal on international taxation is truly historic and Canada is very involved working with our partners in the US, in the EU, around the world. At the OECD itself, we're very involved in working to be sure the deal is implemented and I'm confident that it will be. It's important and, and it's very good for Canada. 
Uh, hi, Minister. Uh, you spoke uh, in your speech about the role of the Bank of Canada. Do people, I'm so sorry, guys, I don't always see you guys here in Toronto. Do people mind introducing themselves? Hi, Minister. I'm Jessica Smith Cross. I'm the editor in chief of iPolitics in Queen's Park Briefing. Okay, great to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, you spoke about the role of the Bank of Canada in fighting inflation, but you didn't really touch on the fear that some can Canadians have about the consequences of what they're doing. The interest rates going up, they're losing, may not be able to afford their home, their mortgages and losing their homes. So what should or what even could your government be doing for those people who have that fear right now? Um, well, let me say a few things. First of all, I do think that a lot of Canadians have real justifiable concerns about the economy right now. Um, whether those concerns are about, you know, wow, it was really expensive to fill up my truck today, or those concerns are about, you know, I'm going to have to renew my mortgage. It looks like the rate is going to be higher. Those are very real, entirely legitimate anxieties for people to have. Um, this is an uncertain time, and it's a time where we're seeing real global economic challenges that have real consequences in people's lives. Um, on mortgages and the financial system, I think it is important to reassure Canadians about the real stability of Canada's financial sector. This is a historic strength of our country. Canada has a well-regulated, well-capitalized banking system. I saw myself as, you know, I was one of you guys, as a financial reporter in New York in 2008. I saw the real strength that the Canadian banking system had relative to its peers. That is a strength that is based on fundamentals, and it's a strength we have. And I think Canadians should take deep comfort from that reality. The other thing I will say is you will remember that last summer, an announcement we made in May, which came into force in June, uh, the government acting in tandem with OSFI tightened the stress test requirements precisely because we wanted to take every action we could to ensure that Canadians who took out a mortgage would be in a position to pay their mortgage even were the interest rate environment to change. So, you know, we have been looking ahead. And then the final thing that I will say is, you know, this, we together as a whole country um, are navigating challenging economic conditions. Um, our government is going to be working hard to stay close to Canadians, to talk to Canadians, to be agile in responding to those conditions. And, you know, I was very focused in the budget in April uh, on fiscal responsibility to ensure that we maintained the fiscal firepower that I think it's good for a country to have in uncertain economic times. My follow-up is, is sort of related. Uh, the part of your speech about uh, undermining Canada's fundamental institutions, including the Bank of Canada, being irresponsible and uh, economically illiterate, was that targeted at any one person like Pierre Polyev in particular? I said exactly what I meant to say in my speech. Hi, Minister. Mark Rendell with the Globe and Mail. Uh, I guess I'm wondering why there was nothing new on inflation announced today. We've seen other peer governments around the world, whether it's the U.S. with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, Germany's passed a significant inflation uh, relief package. In the U.K., you're seeing things like excess energy tax to be funneled back into relief. Uh, everything that was announced today, or, or I shouldn't say announced, was spoken about today, has appeared in the last several budgets. Uh, the inflation picture's changed. The Fed did 75 basis points yesterday. Everybody's been shocked by how high it is. Why didn't we see anything new uh, today? 
Um, so first of all, when it comes to comparisons between Canada and peer countries, I think we can hold our head up high. Uh, our economic numbers right now are looking pretty good uh, compared to our G7 peers um, in most respects. Uh, and that's a good thing for our country and it's especially a good thing heading into economically challenging times. Uh, second of all, um, I was very uh, transparent and I sort of tried in my remarks to underline the fact that I wasn't talking about new money, that I was in fact talking about money that was already in the fiscal framework that had already been announced in the budget this year and last year, money that has already been accounted for in our AAA credit rating. But what I think is also important to bear in mind is for everyone here, um, you know, you guys are financial and economic and business journalists. I hope you've read the budget, um, the budgets. I really do because like I work hard at them and I write a lot of it myself. But I know that most Canadians don't read our budget books. They have much better things to do with their time. Um, David disagrees with me, but he's wrong. <laughs> they do have better things to do with their time. Um, I'm going to allow myself one little footnote here. Actually, campaigning last summer, one person did actually say to me, I read the budget, I really liked it. So that's one person I know, actual Canadian human, who said that. But I think most Canadians don't read our budget books. And it was really important for me to point out to Canadians that this new money, some of it has started to arrive. A lot of it is coming in the course of this year. And it's a lot of money, $8.9 billion in new money on top of the money people were getting a year ago, 8.9 billion, and targeted at exactly the people who a brand new affordability plan would be targeting, right? I mean, think about it. Seniors, low wage working poor Canadians, families with children, particularly families not earning very much money, and the housing affordability, the $500. So, you know, really the measures that we have set in motion already, I think do a pretty good job of reaching precisely those people in Canada who have the biggest challenges with affordability. And I would kind of urge you guys to think about a counterfactual. Imagine we hadn't put those programs in place in 2021 and in the budget in April. Imagine they just weren't there. And that is entirely possible. You know, there was no law of gravity that forced us to increase the Canada worker benefit. There was no, nothing that forced us to increase the OAS, nothing that forced us to put childcare there. If we didn't have any of those programs and I was presenting you guys with something entirely new and I said, I'm doing something for working poor, for seniors, for poor families, for people with housing challenges, that's really pretty well focused on the people who need it the most. And I see it as a feature and not a bug that these measures are in place already. Why is it a feature and not a bug? First of all, because some of this money is already in the system and is already flowing through to Canadians, particularly the Canada worker benefit, but also childcare. That took some time to put in place, but we've done it now. And it's also a feature and not a bug that this is in this year's budget and last year's budget already because it's accounted for in the fiscal framework already. So that's why I think it's a good thing that these programs are already out there. I think it's important to tell Canadians about it. And look, I do want to conclude, as I said in my remarks, um, by emphasizing the need for agility and flexibility, and for us as a government 
to be really close to the ground, to be listening to people, to be watching the changing environment, and to be ready to do more as needed. Mark, sorry, I just need to interrupt you for a moment because we need to I take a vote. quick <laughs> okay. parliamentary vote, but we'll be right back. Actually, you can't. It's facial recognition software. So just give me a minute, but I will come back. Okay. Yay. 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 Yeah. I it, follow up on basically immediately what you ended with on the topic of being nimble. Uh, you said in the speech not ruling out future support uh, and I'm guessing responding to incoming economic data and all that. What What is on the table? Like what, what potential future supports are being considered right now? I think, you know, I meant what I said about the need to be agile, the need to really be aware of the fact that this is a fast changing economic environment. Uh, and so let me just, I'm just gonna repeat what I said, which is we're gonna watch the data, we're gonna spend some time talking to Canadians, seeing, what is happening in their lives. We're gonna keep a close watch on the programs I've already described, which are being dispersed right now and be mindful of the impact they are having. Um, and, you know, definitely keep the door open to further action as the global economic environment uh, evolves and as the Canadian economy evolves and and you know crucially um, what we're going to be watching is the accomplishment of this soft landing uh, I think we all know that that's going to be challenging but really Canada has a better shot than anybody else uh, and I really can't emphasize too much uh, how how many global factors there are which are profoundly uncertain, which are having an impact today. Um, I, I talked about them, none of them are a mystery. There's China's uh, COVID zero approach, the illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think we're going to have to all watch very closely what happens with the global food situation as a result. So we'll look at all of that and you're right to emphasize the point that I did make, which is we understand we need to be agile, we need to be open to further action as the situation develops. Thank you. Sean Benjamin, CBC News. It's a similar uh, question, but you were, when all these uh, announcements were made a little while ago, we were all saying that this inflation was transitory. That was the, the assumption that it was just going to move on and it seems to have been quite uh, quite a bit more sticky does this new reality uh, mean that you need new policies going forward um, look Sean as I said um, and I invite everyone here to try to do this counterfactual experiment with me um, I, I truly believe 
that the nearly $9 billion of money, which is new for Canadians, $8.9 billion going directly to support vulnerable Canadians on top of what they had last year. Um, that's a meaningful support program. Uh, I think it is very well targeted for the circumstances we face today. It focuses on seniors. It focuses on a group that I think we need to think about a lot, which is people who are working but for very low wages. It focuses on families with children, particularly poor families. Uh, and it focuses on people facing housing affordability challenges. That to me, I, I, I'm not going to claim that these measures are going to cover every single person, but I will say they do a pretty good job of covering the most vulnerable who need the support the most. And these are measures like they're coming now. <laughs> the, the money has started to flow. I think that's a good thing. Uh, Yannick Lepage, Radio Canada. Euh, on l'a mentionné ici, des dépenses qui sont déjà dans les budgets. Par contre, on en fait la promotion. Il y a plusieurs experts qui disent que donner de l'argent aux gens, c'est la pire façon de combattre l'inflation. Qu'est-ce que vous avez à dire pour défendre cette stratégie-là? Euh, je vais dire deux choses. Um, je suis d'accord que c'est un moment pour une approche uh, responsable en ce qui concerne la fiscalité. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle j'ai pris une approche responsable dans le budget en avril. Euh, et aujourd'hui, j'ai continué de prendre cette approche responsable fiscale. Euh, oui, 8,9 milliards de dollars, c'est beaucoup de l'argent. C'est une bonne chose parce qu'il y a des Canadiens vulnérables qui ont besoin de l'aide. Mais c'est de l'argent qui est très ciblé. Ce n'est pas pour tout le monde, c'est pour les Canadiens les plus vulnérables. Et peut-être la chose la plus importante, c'est que cet argent qui est déjà annoncé, c'est de l'argent que les économistes savent qu'on va dépenser. Et en savant ça, les agences ont confirmé le niveau triple A du Canada. Alors, je peux dire, et ce n'est pas une rêve, ce n'est pas une idée, c'est une fait. Je peux dire que selon les experts, c'est de l'argent que le Canada peut se permettre de dépenser. Oui, en suivi, on sait que le Québec a donné des chèques de 500 dollars, l'Alberta a donné des rabais à la pompe. Pourquoi ne pas avoir pris ces approches-là? À cause de la question que vous avez juste me posée. <rire> Donc, des dépenses plus ciblées. Plus ciblé, et je pense que pour l'aujourd'hui, euh, c'est une bonne nouvelle pour les Canadiens qu'on a en même temps des dépenses ciblées, mais généreux pour ceux qui ont besoin de l'aide, mais aussi des dépenses qui sont déjà incluses dans... Euh, les projections fiscales du fédéral. Hello, Jamie from City TV. I confess I did not read every word of your budget, but Cormac <laughs> McSweeney did, and he's asking but you these were questions. With me, but you were with me today on <laughs> no. our ride around Toronto, so. Yes. Um, so Cormac McSweeney just basically um, is asking, is the government, consider the fact that the, the, a percentage of gas is such a large part of inflation, and you have new taxes on gas, and you have a, a rising percentage of gas on tax, so you have a bit of a windfall there. Is the government considering su suspending or eliminating any taxes on gasoline? Is that an option on the table? So, as I said in my remarks, and as we have now discussed amongst ourselves quite a bit, um, I didn't come here today to announce new measures. Um, we are very much leaving the door open to further action. Um, our approach thus far has been about looking at who are the most vulnerable Canadians, who are the people facing the biggest challenges when it comes to inflation, um, 
and common sense tells us, you know, that is um, people, the people who we've spoken about, right? That's the working poor, it's seniors, it's poor families with children. Economic analysis that has been done by the department also really clearly shows that uh, the affordability challenge is most acute for the bottom quintile, again, common sense for Canadians. And our approach thus far has been to focus support to them. I think that's an approach that makes sense. And then the next one is economists predict that inflation will continue to rise in the weeks and months ahead. If higher rates, interest rates don't cool inflation, what measures can be taken? There are so many hypotheticals embedded okay, in that the question. <laughs> so, um, let, but but I, let, let me say one thing. People so, are looking for relief. Yeah. What so, can you tell them? Well, look, I think there are, t there, are, there are many hypotheticals, and I think in general it's bad practice for anyone, least of all a finance minister, to answer hypotheticals. I also found as a trade minister it was a bad it's idea. A but I will say, I'll say uh, let me say two things. Rates are I'll, t I'll, t I'll touch on two aspects, though, okay? okay? Um, so first of all, you know, one aspect of your question is affordability. It's a challenge now. Will it be a challenge going forward? What are we going to do about it? And there, let me say, you know, I've outlined today and pulled together really significant measures to help people with affordability right now, money going out the door right now. I do not rule out the possible need for further action, depending on how the situation evolves. That's point one. And then point two, the question about, you know, the crystal ball question. What's going to happen to inflation? What's going to happen to interest rates? There, I think it's really important for us to all be clear uh, about what the job of the Bank of Canada is, what the job of monetary policy is, and to be, you know, have a lot of respect for that role, and also to understand uh, the very strong track record of the Bank of Canada in keeping inflationary expectations from becoming entrenched. Thank you. Thanks. Dave Parkinson, the Global Hi, Mail. Hi, Dave. Good to see uh, you. Good to see you, too. Um, you talked in the speech, obviously, about a lot of the, uh, the causes behind the high inflation that we're dealing with. One of the things you didn't talk a lot about is the role of stimulative fiscal policy in contributing to an economy that the Bank of Canada and economists in general and your opposition agree the economy is in significant excess demand and fiscal policy has contributed to the growth in that demand. And I'm wondering if, I guess first of all, how you respond to that, that concern that fiscal policy has, has contributed to the excess demand situation we're in right now and in retrospect, should the government have, have moved sooner to wind back um, the uh, fiscal stimulus? Um, so actually, Dave, um, I would disagree with you that I didn't address that in my remarks because I think that I did. And I'm going to give you, uh, go through the three ways in which I think I addressed that point. Um, okay, I, I said you didn't address it as, uh, to the same degree. But that's yeah, no, 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 fair enough. But let me, like... Obviously, I think about that question a lot, and um, I did uh, seek to address it in my remarks, and I'm glad to have the question because it gives me a chance to kind of underscore uh, the points that I sought to make. Um, point one is part of the solution in a situation of excess demand is to increase supply, and we we're very focused on that in the budget this year. Uh, and we have real practical measures in place to increase supply. One of the areas where economists, business people are most concerned that there is excess demand and inadequate supply is obviously the labor market. And we've been doing a lot to increase labor supply. I've talked a lot about childcare, but I'm not going to stop because that is a real measure to increase labor supply. And by the way, one of the great things about early learning and childcare as a labor force solution 
is you don't have to build a new house for a mother who goes to work. <laughs> she already lives here. So that's really great. Um, second way of increasing supply is immigration. And I do think this is one of Canada's profound competitive advantages. I think it's one of the reasons that our economy is so strong today relative to our peers. And that's something that as a government we are really leaning into. So that's another meaningful supply side solution. And you know, the different areas that I talked about on skills, also really, really important. Um, you know, something that I hear about a lot, I'm sure you do as well, is a shortage of people in the skilled trades. Um, we have some important measures in this year's budget, but also in last year's budget that are just coming into action right now on skills training, including supporting unions in apprenticeship training. So to me, to my, from my perspective, um, we are doing a lot of work on the supply side, particularly labor supply, and that is an important part of the answer uh, to the demand challenges the economy is facing. I see the Canada Worker Benefit as part of our supply side solution as well. Um, if you make it more worthwhile for people to work, more people will work. And I'm even going to add to the supply side argument uh, something that I take real note of when I look at the difference between Canada and the US particularly the labor force participation levels. Uh, I think our effectiveness in keeping COVID under control has really helped us with labor supply. In the US, I think you do see that people just being sick and suffering from long COVID is part of the labor challenge. And it's less of a challenge here because we've done a better job on COVID. So that's part one, supply. I'm going to. Will you bear with me? I want to say two more things because it's a complicated question. So part one, working on supply. Part two, um, in terms of, uh, you know, our very ambitious fiscal response to the COVID recession, um, is, you know, I would say absolutely I would do it again. And absolutely it was the right thing to do. Um, and here I think I'm in the very good company of Stephen Pelos and David Dodge. Um, I think it's very important when looking at the fiscal response to the COVID recession, it's important for us to consider the counterfactual of a prolonged, deep, and crippling recession. And that could easily have happened had the government not been there. So I feel very, very comfortable with the action we took. And then finally, on the question of, you know, is it time to pull back the reins of the fiscal horse? Um, which is how I think about it sometimes. Um, yeah, it is. And we did that in the April budget. And something that I did point out in my remarks, uh, which you know maybe hasn't been fully appreciated by the Canadian body politic, um, is Canada today has, within the G7, Canada is tied with the US for the fastest pace of fiscal consolidation. I think, I think that's the right place for us to be. But it's, and, and I'd like Canadians to know that that's a decision our government took in the budget. I, uh, my question required a very complicated answer, so I'm going to step aside. Okay, okay, and I, I'm sorry for the long answer, but it's a complicated subject, as you know, so. Uh, Ross Morris, the Canadian Press. First, I want to ask you about, um, you know, inflation showing no signs of abating. So is this really the, the time to add more money? What do you say to people, who, I think you answered it in French, but what do you say yeah. to people who say this is not the right time to spend more? I mean, 
it, it's a, thank you for asking the question. Um, et merci pour la question en français aussi. Um, it is an important question. Um, and that is the balance that we are working very, very hard to strike. Um, and that's the balance that I think we found. So, you know, what I am talking about today with Canadians is really two things. On the one hand, I do want people to know, especially the most vulnerable Canadians, you know, the kind of people who really are having a hard time paying their bills at the end of the month. The kind of people who, when they go to the gas station, are like, oh my God, is that how much it costs? And there are a lot of Canadians like that. And I want them to know that there is significant money already in the pipeline, some of it already deployed earlier this year, to help those most vulnerable Canadians with affordability challenges. Those challenges are real, and it's really appropriate for the government to support them. On the other hand, your point, um, and also Dave's point, about uh, the need for fiscal restraint today is a good one as well. And that is why I was very thoughtful in the April budget about putting forward a fiscally restrained budget. Um, and as I just said in answer to Dave's question, you know, don't take my word for it, right? Like how do you judge is it fiscally restrained or not? I think a pretty good way of judging that is look at our peer countries. And if you look at our peer countries, you'll see that Canada's rate of fiscal consolidation is tied for the fastest in the G7, tied with the US. That suggests to me that we showed real fiscal restraint in this budget. And we did it precisely because we could see that we were in an environment of elevated inflation. And the appropriate thing on the fiscal side was to show restraint. And my second question is, you know, the housing uh, propped up the economy when times were good. To, to some degree, um, how cons and, and it's cooling off significantly now, how concerned are you that there will be not a soft landing? And among the worries that you have, how does this not a hard landing fit among them in terms of prompting the government to do something? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And, uh, you know, everyone in Canada, for sure everyone in Toronto, uh, talks and thinks a lot about housing and house prices. Um, for people who are fortunate enough to own a house, your house is usually your most important family asset. And for new Canadians or for young Canadians, the dream of buying a house is sort of a central life objective. So housing matters, house prices matter. Um, I think it's important for us to be candid with each other, with Canadians, that this is a volatile economic time and an uncertain economic time. And that volatility and uncertainty uh, is largely driven by a really turbulent global environment. And for that reason, I can't make any promises to Canadians about how the next weeks and months are going to unfold. And I want to be honest about that. But I, I want to kind of, um, you know, balance that candor with a really confident and true assertion. And that is, that Canada is going into this turbulent global economic environment with real fundamental economic strengths. We're going into it, you know, as I said, with what the IMF and the OECD and Moody's predict will be the strongest growth in the G7 this year and next year. That's really a good thing. Um, I see the strong labor market, both low unemployment, 
but equally importantly, high labor force participation as extremely important as we go into this volatile economic time. Because I really believe, you know, for the overwhelming majority of Canadians, having a job and having a good job, that's the most important way you support your family, you support yourself. And this is an economy that is allowing more Canadians than ever to do that, and that's really important. And then the final thing I'll say about house prices and the housing market is um, it is really important for Canadians to be reassured by the reality that we have a very well-regulated, um, even a small c conservative regulated financial sector. Uh, and that includes the mortgage market. So we do have some real tested over time structural strengths to how we manage the financial sector in Canada, and that includes mortgage lending. And we saw Canada's relative strength in that respect in 2008. Uh, and as I mentioned in response to an earlier question, you know, we took action, OSFI accompanied by the federal government, to toughen up the stress test last summer. Um, precisely because it was apparent then that, you know, low rates would not continue forever. Thank you. We have time for one last quick view. So. And I think okay. then everyone has had their shot, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, Derek DeCliff from Bloomberg News. Uh, thinking back to the money that the government borrowed uh, in 2020 and 2021, could the government have done a better job of borrowing more longer, locking in those low rates before long rates uh, went up? In your view? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And we really, really focused on pushing out the maturities of our borrowing. It's something that I talked about in last year's budget and something that we were very aggressive about doing. So we pushed our borrowing out to longer maturities than it had been at beforehand for precisely the reasons underlying your question. I guess another housing question, um, given that shelter is a major part of people's uh, costs, how would the government really regard a, a sustained uh, decline in, in home prices? You know, again, and I apologize for um, the uh, frustration this part of my answer will cause. I really think uh, it's unwise for uh, a finance minister to speculate about hypotheticals. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but I do want to say on how I'll say a couple of things on housing. Um, the core challenge for Canada when it comes to housing is not enough supply. That's our real underlying problem. We have a growing population that is a huge and unique in the industrialized world economic strength of our country. Um, and our housing supply just hasn't kept up. Uh, whatever the vagaries of the market, it's important for the government to be committed to a suite of policies to promote the building of more homes. And that really was a central element of the April budget, and that's something that we're going to continue to pursue. And when you think about Canadian housing in the medium term, solving the housing supply challenge, that's the single most important thing. Now, as to your question, which it's a very good one, and it's a good one from a macroeconomic point of view, and it's also a good one in terms of the anxiety Canadians are feeling. Um, the core reassurance that I can offer both to Canadian homeowners 
and to financial markets is that Canada's housing, Canada's financial sector, including mortgage lending, is well regulated. It is prudently regulated. We toughened the stress test last summer. I'm glad we did that. And so that should give people some core confidence. And I, the final thing I'll say about housing is just to go back to the supply point, you know, the reason that we need to focus so much on supply is unlike other rich industrialized countries, our population is growing because we're a country that likes and welcomes immigrants. So we need to keep on building more homes and our government is committed to making that happen. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. want to apologize for keeping you guys waiting for so long and also for the rather long answers, but these are complicated issues.